Uh, time is tight, so the next item of business is a debate on motion 8352 in the name of Michael Russell on Scotland and the EU-UK negotiations on EU exit. Can I invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? I repeat, time is tight. I call on Mike Russell to speak to move the motion. Minister, 12 minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Presiding Officer, the fifth round of the Phase 1 negotiations on EU exit concluded on the 12th of October. Today provides an opportunity to set out the Scottish Government's assessment of progress on the EU-UK negotiations which have taken place to date. It also allows this Parliament to consider the process of EU withdrawal and to express its concerns about some recent developments. The context for so doing remains very clear and should be stated at the outset of every debate about Brexit in Scotland. Scotland did not vote for Brexit. And opinion polls indicate that Scotland would still not vote for Brexit. Indeed, it is likely it would be rejected by an even wider margin. And Scotland's best interests, and the best interests of all who live and work here, would be best served by remaining in the EU. That point was emphasised in the media yesterday following analysis by the LSE on the economic consequences of Brexit. This presented some stark figures for Scotland, even from a so-called soft Brexit. Their calculations showed that over five years, Edinburgh would lose £3.2 billion from such a Brexit, Glasgow would use to, lose 2.9, but Aberdeen would lose 2.4. Even my own constituency of Argyll and Butte would lose out to the tune of £170 million, which, given the difficulties of the area, would be a very severe blow. But if there was a no-deal Brexit, the figures go from dreadful to catastrophic. Glasgow would be down £5.4 billion. Edinburgh, 5.5 billion. Argyll and Butte, 350 million. And Aberdeen, the worst hit by percentage in the country, 3.8 billion. The economic, social, and reputational damage of such an outcome would, inf that would inflict would be excessive, unwarranted, and unwanted. So the first conclusion this chamber needs to draw is that no deal is a no deal. It cannot and must not happen. It's foolish for the UK government to use such a threat even as a negotiating tactic. Things are bad enough without that. Let us then look, presiding officer, at the state of the negotiations. There has been some small progress in the last few weeks, a dependent, it appears, on the Prime Minister, as she indicated in her Florence speech, at last being willing to show a modicum of flexibility. Though negotiations are about dialogue, not about speeches. But considerable challenges remain for the UK. And the devolved administrations face additional problems as a result of the UK's government's failure to abide by the agreed terms of reference of the Joint Ministerial Committee on EU Negotiations. Nonetheless, and I want to be as positive as I can today, I want to pay tribute to the attempts by the new First Secretary of the UK government, Damien Green, to improve that situation. I'm also grateful to my colleague John Swinney for his involvement. And I'm pleased to be able to tell the Chamber that all the parties in this Parliament have been able to have constructive discussion about the withdrawal bill. And I hope that such dialogue on matters of Brexit will continue. It's encouraging that most of us have been able to agree on the motion in front of us today. And although the Conservatives have not, it's useful. Their amendment refers to the likelihood of amendment to the EU withdrawal bill, as the Secretary of State for Scotland did yesterday in his evidence to the Westminster Scottish Affairs Select Committee. On the matter of the withdrawal bill, I can also report that at last week's reconvened JMC-EN meeting, some progress was made in agreeing general principles that should ensure the role of the Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland parliaments and governments in any potential UK-wide frameworks. However, I want to be clear that the Scottish Government remains unable to recommend that the Scottish Parliament consent to the EU withdrawal bill as currently drafted, and the same is true of the Welsh Government. Neither will be in a position to recommend consent until the bill is amended in keeping with the proposals now tabled at Westminster by Labour, Liberal, SNP, Plaid Cymru and Green MPs. These amendments ensure that the devolved settlement is respected and not undermined. Let me now turn to the wider question of the negotiations between the UK and the EU. The first round began on the 19th of June, with the fifth round concluding on 12th October. Yet despite all the talking, last week the European Council did not agree that there had been sufficient progress to allow a move from exit discussions to consideration of transition and future relationship. Instead, the Council called on the negotiators to make more progress on outstanding issues, including in relation to citizens' rights and the financial settlement. However, in a positive gesture, the EU27 have empowered Michel Barnier to make internal preparations for that second phase. 
The Secretary of State for exiting the EU, David Davis, always an optimist, asserted at the conclusion of the fifth round talks that we have come a long way. But even he could not avoid the fact that in his own words, there is still work to be done. And it is the work to be done that remains my concern. The clock is ticking. It's vital that there is certainty for both individuals and businesses now. Businesses are making planning decisions now for 2020 and beyond. And citizens of other EU member states need to plan their own futures. They will either leave the UK or choose not to locate here based on the rights they will have and the welcome they receive. Of course. Mr Tompkins. I'm grateful to the Minister for, give, for giving way. Will he therefore, on the point of business uh, confidence and certainty, will he therefore welcome uh, the um, announcement that the Prime Minister made in her Florence speech that it's the UK government's intention to have a two-year transition or implementation period? I'll be coming to the transition issue and I will be welcoming it uh, in a way. Um, it is, however, presiding officer, simply unacceptable. There's so much uncertainty surrounding the rights of EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in other EU countries after Brexit. And it's disappointing that in her open letter to EU citizens, the Prime Minister was still not able to give more clarity. The Scottish Government has repeatedly called for assurances that EU citizens would have their rights protected in the place they choose to call their home. We've continually stressed that EU citizens and their families who make a vital contribution to Scotland and to our economy and demography and to our culture and society must be able to feel they are at home here. We welcome, of course, the commitment by the Prime Minister to ensure the system of applying for settled status will be streamlined and straightforward. We believe that settled status should be granted free of charge. The First Minister has made it clear that if a fee is imposed, as a minimum, the Scottish Government will meet the cost for EU nationals working in our public services. But there do remain a number of key issues outstanding. We therefore urge the UK Government to reach agreement immediately with the EU27. Let me now come to transition. And again, I'm pleased that the Prime Minister recognised the need for a transition period in her Florence speech, despite she and her ministers ruling it out on every possible occasion up until then. It's good they recognised that was the wrong approach. At the very minimum, a substantial transition period is essential to give people and businesses the certainty they require to get on with their lives and work. However, we still need clarity from the UK government on how it will work in practice. Mixed messages on issues such as membership of CAP and CFP Coded remarks about some parts taking less time are not helping anyone, except perhaps the extreme Brexiteers. The substance of the transition must be clear, as must the long-term destination. Confusion about these and other issues simply adds to the overall atmosphere of chaos. The UK is due to leave the EU on the 29th of March 2019. But the UK government is not only still mired in phase one negotiations, it also cannot seem to decide what route it's asking to take after that, in order to avoid the cliff edge. And as a result, confusion reigns amongst businesses, investors, and the public, exacerbated by the stream of contradictions and mixed messages that flow from the internal divisions of the UK government. Now, presiding officer, considering all that, and reading the government's own negotiating and position papers, it's little wonder that so many, the Scottish government certainly, but a growing number in the country and out with it, firmly believe that full EU membership remains the best possible option for this country and for our economy. That's what we want. Now, if possible, uh, if you can give me... Oh, of course, I'm happy to take an intervention. I just on that point, Willie when, Rennie. Um, whether the Minister would welcome the comments from the President of the European Council this week when he told MEPs, it's up to London how this will end, with a good deal, no deal, or no Brexit. Would you welcome those remarks? Minister. I would indeed. I think those remarks are to be supported because they happen to be true. And what we want now, we want full membership now if possible, later if necessary. And in the interim, if we find ourselves having to be dragged out, then we wish and will continue to argue for continued membership of the European single market and the EU customs union, not as transition, but as destination. Many others have moved or are moving to that position too. And we urge all parties who are not there yet, and particularly the UK government, to recognize that this is the only way of avoiding severe damage. There would still be damage. We see that from the LSE analysis, but less under this scenario than any other. This month, the Scottish Government published What's at Stake for Business, a collection of commentaries from companies with real and deep concerns about the consequences of Brexit. The document highlights the importance of the outcomes reached in the negotiations and the very real issues at stake. And later, we're going to publish a parallel document about individual citizens' concerns, uh, if you allow me to make some progress. 
The presiding officer, the Scottish Government and this Parliament has a legitimate interest in both in the terms of withdrawal, including transition, and the overall shape of the future relationship. Many of the things we do and the responsibilities we have will be profoundly affected by withdrawal, by transition, and by negotiated future relationship. It's therefore highly regrettable that the UK Government has acted in direct contradiction to the terms of reference of the Joint Ministerial Committee by publishing a series of papers that purport to set out a UK position without prior engagement with the devolved administrations. Some of those papers largely ignore the Scottish dimension. Some mention it in passing without any detail. At least one seems to have been drafted in complete ignorance of the existence of a separate Scottish legal system and Scottish responsibility for, amongst other things, a separate prosecution and police system, an independent Lord Advocate, and involvement in extradition and international justice cooperation, issues that long predate the UK's membership of the EU. I made it clear to David Davis and to Damien Green I remain deeply concerned that the Scottish Government's views were not taken into consideration in the development of these papers. The EU can put no reliance on commitments entered into as a result of the presentation of partial or simply wrong information by the UK. That should not be happening. There is no reason why the Scottish Government's position should not be fully reflected in any and all negotiating opposition papers and in the UK Government's current and future positions. It is therefore absolutely essential that the UK Government involve in a new and fundamental way the Scottish Government in any further developments on EU exit and in the next phase of negotiations, and we indicated that to the JMC meeting which was held in London last Monday. I welcome the fact that meeting has been reconvened. I've indicated the meeting set a positive tone for further engagement, but tone must translate into substance. And I took the opportunity at the meeting to press the UK Government on the issues I've touched on today. Going forward, it's vital that the JMC is utilised in the spirit it was created for regular engagement between the UK Government and the devolved administrations. This is a space in which we can all be heard and which we can reach a true UK-wide position. We must make sure that that meeting is at the heart of what we do. Presiding officer, over the last 14 months, actually to the day that I've been in the position of Minister for UK Negotiations and Scotland's place in Europe, I welcome the support and challenge from this Parliament and its committees. It's now more crucial than ever that our collective and unified voice is heard. The threat to devolution is faced with solidarity and we are clear together that Scotland's interests in our future relationship with Europe cannot be ignored. I therefore move the motion in my name in the hope it will attract the support of the whole chamber. Thank you very much, Minister. I call on Adam Tompkins to speak to and move Amendment 852.1. Mr Tompkins, eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I move the amendment in my uh, name. Um, I want to say uh, a few things, first of all, about this idea of uh, no deal. Um, it is absolutely not the UK government's preferred outcome to leave the European Union with no deal. Uh, it's not what, what we want, and when I say what we want, what I mean is what both the United Kingdom government wants and what the Scottish Conservatives want is a bold, ambitious and comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU 27. That is in the UK's, I'm in my first sen sentence, Mr Rennie, that is in the UK's national interest. Um, it is likewise in the European Union's interests. And given that the United Kingdom starts from a position that is wholly compliant with EU law, it should not be difficult to achieve if the political will is there on both sides. As the Prime Minister said in her Florence speech that the Minister referred to a few moments ago, we, let's just say the United Kingdom on the one hand and the European Union on the other, share the same fundamental beliefs, a fundamental belief in frictionless free and fair trade, a fundamental belief in fair competition, a fundamental belief in strong consumer rights. Given this starting point, it should not be difficult to arrive at the destination that has been outlined. But the United Kingdom, I will in a second, but the United Kingdom government has taken the view that the United Kingdom cannot remain in the European single market because the European Union insists that the four fundamental freedoms that, core, that form the core of the internal market, of internal market law are indivisible. And you cannot take back control of your national borders inside the single market. That isn't the British government's conclusion, that's the European Union's conclusion. And we have to recognize and respect the European Union's negotiating position as well. And the European Union's negotiating position is that the four fundamental freedoms are indivisible. That means if you want 
to be in the single market. You have to accept all four parts uh, of uh, that. And it is worth noting today, and the Minister spoke about this in his remarks a few mo moments ago, but it is worth noting today that the Scottish Government's motion does not call for the United Kingdom to remain in the single market or in the customs union. I've got four people who want to intervene on me now, and I've got eight minutes, so I'll give away to the Minister. You're just could, popular, could I, Mr Topkins. <laughs> Minister. Could I just, for the, 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 to, so that it's absolutely clear, make it clear that I have argued in my speech, have argued before, will argue again, and the Scottish Government's position is remaining in the single market. If we cannot remain in the EU, the remaining in the EU is a preference. Adam Topkins. Well, thank, thank you for that clarification, Minister, which is, which is well understood, but it's not in your motion today, which I thought was worth uh, no, no, noting. Now, the, our amendment says that progress towards the ends that I've just sketched of a free trade agreement is being made, but should be accelerated. It was, of course, the European Union, not the UK, that insisted that progress should be made on three preliminary points before we can even start talking about a new free trade partnership with the EU 27. First of all, of course, the divorce bill. And again, this is something on which the SNP front bench has been entirely silent. There's nothing in the motion. There were no remarks in the minister's speech. I wonder if the minister in closing uh, might reflect on what the Scottish government's position is on the size and means of payment of the divorce bill that the European Union uh, is demanding. Is that an area where the Scottish government is seeking to support the United Kingdom government? Or is it an area where the um, Scottish government is seeking to support the EU 27? The second preliminary area is, of course, Northern Ireland. And the United Kingdom has given a clear and unambiguous commitment to protecting the Belfast Agreement and the common travel area, a commitment which is happily shared by the EU27, including, of course, Ireland. Both sides have likewise stated explicitly that they will not accept any physical infrastructure on the border. And that, it seems to me, is to be welcomed. And the third preliminary uh, point uh, is that uh, there must be um, a safeguarding of the position of uh, EU nationals. And I think that the Prime Minister has been crystal clear about this over and again. First, in her Florence speech last month, she said this, and I quote, I want all EU citizens who've made their lives in our country to stay. We value you. We thank you for your contribution to our national life. It, ha it has been and remains one of my first goals in this negotiation to ensure that EU nationals in Britain carry on living their lives as before. And just two days ago, in the House of Commons, the Prime Minister added this. The Prime Minister, let me finish the point, Mr Johnson, and then I'll let you in if I have time. The Prime Minister said this. Um, we are in touching distance of a deal on EU citizens, she said, and that deal will provide certainty about residence, health care, pensions, and other benefits. It will mean that EU citizens who've paid into the UK system and UK nationals who've paid into the system of an EU 27 country can benefit from what they have put in. It will enable families who have built their lives together to stay together, and it will provide guarantees that the rights of those UK nationals currently living in the EU and EU citizens currently living in the UK will not diverge over time. Daniel Johnson. Thank you. Uh, for, I would thank the member for giving way. The problem with that position is it's still treating EU citizens as a bargaining chip. That's not an unequivocal offer. It's contingent on acceptance and it, it, it is reliant on other people doing anything rather than an unequivocal guarantee that the UK government could give now. We, we, are in we, we, are, we are in touching distance of a deal on EU citizens, citizens and citizenship, and that's exactly as it should be, and the uh, member would be better advised to welcome the progress that the United Kingdom and the EU have made on this rather than uh, carping from the sidelines. Now, one part of the Scottish Government's motion, presiding officer, with which we on these benches do agree, um, is the welcoming of the reconvening of the JMCEN. Uh, we on these benches like intergovernmental cooperation. We want more intergovernmental cooperation. We think it's good for Scotland and we think it's good for the Union. We want it also, we want it also to be effective. And indeed, we know that it will have to be effective if Brexit is to be delivered as it can be and as it must be in a manner that is compatible with our devolution settlements. And that is why I very much welcome the communique that we had uh, from the JMC after it was published after the JMC uh, on Monday uh, last week with its focus on common frameworks, one of the aspects of Brexit that I think um, we are going to have to spend quite a lot of time focusing on. And on the subject of common frameworks, I note and welcome the statement made by Secretary of State for Scotland, David Mundell, in the House of Commons just this afternoon uh, when he said that a UK framework does not mean 
the, um, the, the, the UK imposing a framework, it means agreement is reached. And that is the position which the Minister has uh, shared with me um, uh, in uh, evidence in the Finance and Constitution Committee, and it is the position which the Secretary of State has endorsed uh, just today, which I think we can all uh, welcome. Which brings me, uh, Presiding Officer, to the European Union Withdrawal Bill. This is a bill which um, is designed uh, to deliver a smooth and successful Brexit, formerly known, and I have to say rather oddly known as, a, as the Great Repeal Bill. It is in reality a, con a continuity bill. It maintains the authority of retained EU law in the UK's legal systems, and it avoids precisely the legal and constitutional cliff edges that Scottish ministers and indeed the Scottish Conservatives have been warning about. The passing of this legislation through the Westminster Parliament requires our consent and the consent of the Welsh Assembly. The UK Government has made it crystal clear that it wants to obtain that consent. So do I, and so I believe does the Minister and the SNP front bench. And to that extent, to that, to that end, a whole series of meetings um, uh, have, been, uh, have been taking place uh, to seek to understand different parties' concerns and to seek to relay those concerns uh, to ministers and others uh, in uh, Westminster. And I will just close, if I may, presiding officer, on this point. Much of the focus on the withdrawal bill has been on Clause 11, and I think it is just worth recording what the Secretary of State, David Mundell, said about Clause 11 in his evidence to the Scottish Affairs Committee in the House of Commons yesterday. He said this, powers will either be with the Scottish Parliament here, or they will be subject to a UK-wide framework to which the Scottish Government is a party. That is what will happen, he said. Now, I think if we can all agree around that sort of uh, position, we can uh, obtain the consent that I think both governments want, and for all of those reasons, presiding officer, I move the amendment in my name. Thank you very much, Mr. Tompkins. I call Lewis MacDonald. Mr. MacDonald, seven minutes, please. <coughs> Thank you very much, presiding officer. Members of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee went to Brussels last month, where we met Michel Barnier. The European Union's chief negotiator made many important points and addressed some complex issues. But one of his simplest points was also one of the most telling. When neg negotiations fail, that usually means going back to the status quo. But in the case of Brexit, no deal would mean something quite different. It would mean Britain becoming a third country with no agreed trading relationship with our main trading partner. It is a simple point, but hugely important. No deal would not mean standing still. It would mean going backwards by some 40 years. Despite the opening comments from the Conservative benches, it is clear that some ministers in the present UK government believe that the threat of walking away without a deal will concentrate minds and persuade EU leaders to make fewer demands and more concessions. There is actually no evidence of that, just as there is no evidence that there is a whole world out there of friendly countries just waiting to reach more generous trade deals with the UK than they would reach with the EU. Boris Johnson, for example, recently suggested that Commonwealth countries might provide an alternative field for British economic activity. He clearly did not know that New Zealand and Canada were already lining up with the United States and Brazil and Argentina to demand increased access for their produce to our markets once the UK is no longer covered by EU quotas for farm produce under WTO rules. It is a pity that the Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary is not a little bit better informed before laying out such wonderful visions, or at least a bit more honest about just what trading under WTO rules will be like if there is no new deal with Europe. Even more remarkable was the sight of the Chancellor of the Exchequer apparently being put in his place by the Prime Minister on preparing for an outcome with no deal. Philip Hammond told MPs that spending now and preparing for failure in the negotiations was likely to be nugatory expenditure, more commonly known as a waste of money. Theresa May, the very next day, was keen to say that that money was already in place and that her government would be ready in the event that no deal could be agreed. Now, it's easy to see why the Chancellor did not want to admit to planning that expenditure. Planning, for example, to build giant lorry parks at Britain's ports 
to allow our exports to get off the road while waiting to join the queue to go through customs before crossing the Channel or the North Sea. Hundreds of millions of pounds spent, yes, on trade policy, but not in speeding up or increasing trade, but on slowing it down. It is also easy to see why David Davis is so reluctant to publish the UK government's assessment of the impact of a no-deal Brexit, or indeed any Brexit, on the nations and regions of the United Kingdom. This week's LSE report uh, on national and regional impact shows that economic output in Scotland could fall by almost £30 billion over five years in the absence of a positive agreement. And as the Minister mentioned, Aberdeen has predicted to take the biggest hit in Britain after the City of London, with Edinburgh and Glasgow not far behind. Now, we heard also already this afternoon <coughs> about comments made by David Mundell uh, 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 this week, and he has declined so far to tell us what the government's own findings are in terms of regional uh, and indeed sectoral impact. But he does uh, concede that there has been a degree of analysis in relationship to Brexit, and he told the Scottish Affairs Committee yesterday that this analysis would be shared with the Scottish Government. So I hope... I I'm Minister. grateful to the member. I understand this morning that the same assurance was given by David Davis to my colleague Joanna Cherry at the uh, Westminster Exit to the EU Committee, but it's very difficult to get a clarification either of those. I do hope, working cross-party, we could persuade uh, the Conservatives to make sure that, that documentation does come to Scotland and is published. Lewis MacDonald. Well, I, I hope for the same, and I also hope that Mr Russell will agree that if that documentation does indeed come to the Scottish Government, it is something that will be of legitimate interest to the Scottish Parliament and indeed uh, to our, the citizens that we are here to represent as well. But of course, the implications of no deal do not stop at trade. A failure to agree would also be devastating for the rights of citizens of other EU countries to stay here and of UK citizens to stay in other EU countries post-Brexit. This is the area where Mrs May and indeed Adam Tompkins uh, want to tell us that we are closest to agreement and perhaps when Mr Tompkins talks about being within touching distance he may be right. But it is an area which as Daniel Johnson said should not have been subject to a bargaining process in the first place and it is an area that is therefore as much at risk as anything else if that bargaining process is unsuccessful. Whatever progress might be achieved as part of a negotiated settlement will be abandoned if there is no deal and that will be hugely damaging for our economy and our society as well as deeply distressing for the individuals and families concerned. And just as the UK government is failing to make real progress in uh, Brussels, so there seems to be an equal lack of progress at Westminster. Today's Conservative Amendment states, and it's a, a, an optimistic uh, a view of the world, the EU, EU withdrawal bill is likely to be amended to address the devolution issues. It certainly should be, given the force of the many amendments which have been put forward with cross-party support to ensure powers over devolved areas are repatriated to the devolved administrations and not the UK government. But the failures and shortfalls of the withdrawal bill do not stop there. Keir Starmer called last weekend for action to improve the bill in six areas where ministers need to act. To remove obstacles to transitional arrangements, again raised by the Conservatives themselves this afternoon, based on the terms of membership of the Single Market and Customs Union beyond March 2019. To safeguard against lawmaking by decree, by reducing the sweeping powers ministers want to have to amend retained laws uh, without full pre, uh, parliamentary process. To guarantee continuation of workers' rights, consumer rights, environmental standards to protect the devolution settlement, entrench fundamental rights and ensure that Parliament, rather than Government, has the final say on whether to uh, approve the withdrawal agreement and how to implement it. All of those areas, presiding officer, require a change of attitude and a change of approach from UK ministers on the EU withdrawal bill before it is fit for purpose. Because we need a Government that wants a deal with Europe. We need a Government that is willing to listen to others in the UK Parliament and in these parliaments, this Parliament and other parliaments too, to safeguard democracy. And frankly, if Mrs May's ministers are not up to that challenge, we also need a change of UK government. 
Thank you. Before I move to the open debate, time is very tight, so speeches will be pleased of six minutes. However, I want to allow time for interventions. Please make these brief. I have to say that if it becomes difficult, then I'm going to ask closing speakers or the other De Deputy Presiding Officer will ask closing speakers perhaps to take a minute off their speeches. I think that's fair to backbenchers. Uh, so I now move to the open debate. I call Mary Goujon to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Ms Goujon, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, we're 16 months down the line from the Brexit vote and seven months down the line from the triggering of Article 50, and I suppose we'll have to ask what's new. But, and I don't think many of us are much the wiser as to what Brexit will actually look like now as to what we were last year. I sit on the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee where we've been undertaking an inquiry into the Article 50 negotiations. And it's on some of the key elements that we've heard in evidence there that I want to focus on today, in particular the rights of EU citizens. Because while we keep hearing from the UK government that much progress has been made, there remain serious hurdles that have to be overcome. And that was confirmed by David Davis in his evidence this morning with no explanation yet as to how that will be done the rights of future family members, the recognition of professional qualifications, UK citizens' rights to move within the rest of Europe and the role of the European Court of Justice in dispute resolution being some of those issues. But the one overarching thread which runs through all of that and all the evidence that we heard is the remaining uncertainty and the lack of clarity for all involved. We heard from panels of legal experts, academics, Lord Kerr, who played a role in drafting Article 50 itself. Dr Tobias Locke from the University of Edinburgh highlighted the situation of EU citizens who are now finding it difficult to find jobs because employers don't know what their situation is going to be in 18 months' time and to find housing because landlords are reluctant to take them on as tenants. And this wasn't just speculation. We had confirmation of that from EU citizens themselves who are living the experience of this every single day. We heard from Eva Smirzinska of the Fife Migrants Forum, who told us that she had been directly told that she had been turned down for a job because her prospective employer would have to spend time training her, to potentially then be told that they were no lo longer allowed to employ anyone from the EU and they would then have to let her go. It's just blatant discrimination. And discrimination based on an incredibly worrying lack of knowledge, a lack of knowledge and certainty on the side of those working here about their rights, as well as on the side of employers who are very badly informed. But there are even more worrying trends developing. Yesterday, The Guardian published an article which highlighted how the uncertainty over Brexit is leading to downright exploitation by unscrupulous employers across the country, citing case after case where workers, particularly those in low paid jobs, are being mistreated and having their rights abused. A comment from Barbara Drozdovich, CEO of the East European Resource Centre, echoed what we heard in committee. She stated, people are worried that they will hire someone and they will have to leave, which isn't true, but shows employers are badly informed. The other side is that there are employers who I believe now want only Eastern European workers because they can treat them badly and threaten them with false information. Margaret Beals, who chairs the Gangmaster and Labour Abuse Authority, highlighted an even more sinister side. People have gone from being unsure about their rights to being tricked into thinking they have no rights at all. By adding yet another layer of uncertainty, Brexit has made it even easier for people, for people trafficking and slavery to take place. Now, it's not hard to understand the lack of knowledge on rights, given the continued uncertainties around the negotiations. And are EU citizens living here directly given the most up-to-date information to help ease that? This was a question posed by the committee to the Fife Migrants Forum. And the answer, they pretty much source that information themselves. On the government website, we're told that Theresa May wrote directly to EU citizens in the UK prior to her recent visit to Brussels. Well, no, she didn't. She published a letter online offering reassurances that she hoped would provide further helpful certainty. But they're meaningless reassurances because there is no certainty and people are losing out on homes and jobs because of it. And this is something which is particularly personal to me and my family because I'm married to an EU citizen. We've gone from looking at him applying for permanent residency here to then be told that this was pointless because everyone would have to apply for settled status. To then be told by David Davis two weeks ago that permanent residents would not have to make a full application for settled status. And so we considered making that application again to then be told online that this would not be valid after Brexit, and then by Amber Rudd that there was no point because everyone will have to apply for settled status biometric residence permits. 
Now, there's something about the, bio, the use of biometric there which makes me think this will be anything but a simple process. And even then, what will settled status even mean? And what will that process involve? No, who knows? Dr Rebecca Zahn from the University of Strathclyde stated that this new status is particularly problematic because it creates legal uncertainty for landlords, employers and even the National Health Service with regard to knowing whether an EU national can be treated and on what grounds they can be treated post-Brexit, depending on what status they fall into. My husband is just one of the thousands of EU citizens who've built their life in this country, who have absolutely no say and no control over the negotiations, which will determine not only their future, but their families and my family's future here. There was no clear defined plan going into these negotiations. There has been backtracking during negotiations and still no clear idea of what our relationship with the EU will be post negotiations all of which means a lack of clarity for EU citizens here and UK citizens abroad. That's why in this parliament, we have to work together to press the UK government to immediately guarantee the, the rights of EU citizens in this country and provide some certainty for their future. Because right now, the only certainty in all of this is that no matter what the outcome of the Brexit negotiations is, whether it's a soft exit, a hard exit or a no deal scenario, Scotland will lose out. Thank you very much. Rachel Hamilton will be followed by Polly McNeill. Ms Hamilton, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The UK Government recognises that British nationals living in the EU27 and EU nationals living in the UK have been concerned about potential changes to processes after the UK leaves the European Union. However, last week, um, as we know, the Prime Minister addressed EU citizens living in the UK and reassured those three million citizens that the government are in touching distance of an agreement. The UK government wants people to stay and families to stay together. They hugely value the contributions that EU nationals make to the economic, social and cultural fabric of the UK. And they know that member states value equally UK nationals living in their communities. Now, the recent address by the Prime Minister is good news. It's positive and it's made progressive steps. And Brexit will be better because of that. To have pragmatic and progressive talks to get the best for the UK and Scotland. And it's in all and it's in everyone's best interest to seek progress. If the SNP had had their way, Scotland would have left the EU and the UK markets. And yes, the UK single market does exist and should not be ignored. The UK single mar market, as we know, is worth four times as much to the Scottish economy as the EU single market. The SNP find it hard to acknowledge that there have been reassurances made by the Prime Minister and given to those three million EU citizens living in the UK. They are welcome, their contributions are valued and they are needed. Just let me finish this point, please. Those granted settled status will be able to live, work, study and claim benefits as they can now. I'll give way to Mary uh, Goujon. Mary Goujon. I thank the member for taking that intervention. Well, maybe the member has some more inside information than what we do here about what settled status will actually mean, what does that process involve, and what do people have to do to get it, and why then, if people have been reassured, are people losing out on jobs and on homes? Rachel Hamilton. I thank, the member for the inter I thank the member for the intervention. I think the Prime Minister made it quite clear what settled status meant in her recent address and her Florence speech. However, this guarantee to EU citizens will not solve our skills shortage. This is something that the Scottish Government has failed to recognise and address. And we must give businesses certainty. The Scottish Government fails to admit the skills shortage in Scottish sectors existed before Brexit. And it's time for the Scottish Government to admit that Brexit cannot be used to brush over this problem. What's at stake for business um, highlights recruitment issues, and many businesses are fed into that document, uh, highlighting those skills shortages. I will. Ross Greer. I'm grateful for Ms Hamilton for taking that intervention. Many of these skills shortages are in areas where incomes are not particularly high. So why does the Conservative government propose setting a minimum income threshold which would deny many people the right to come live here and unite with their own family? Rachel Hamilton. I think what I'm trying to highlight uh, to the member is that these issues of recruitment were here before Brexit. So in, 
the Scottish tourism sector also reported many college and university graduates left the sector within the first two years after qualifying, and it drew attention that modern apprenticeship programmes encourage the delivery of level two qualifications over level three and four, which limits the ability to, to develop higher level skills within key roles. Apprenticeships also targeted at 16 to 19 year olds, which does not address business needs. These issues recorded in 2015 that still pers to persist today were present before Brexit. But we need to work to resolve this. Yeah, no, I won't actually, I, if you don't mind. The lack of skills is hindering one of Scotland's biggest economically advantageous sectors at a time where the sector is seeing increased visitors and trade. And why? Because of Brexit. ONS data shows in July the number of overseas visitors to the UK topped 4 million for the first time. And Visit Britain said that over the first seven months of the year, the number of overseas visits to the UK rose by 8% to 23.1 million, compared with the same period last year. Deputy Presiding Officer, the SNP have failed to recognise that sectors such as the service industry have experienced recruitment issues for years, Brexit or no Brexit. And moving forward, we need to look at how we can develop our future relationships with the EU and as well as kick-starting uh, regular joint ministerial committee meetings the Scottish and the UK government should be working hard to secure opportunities for our biggest markets and businesses and the Scottish government I believe should invest time and energy in exploring more opportunities not trying to disrupt and hinder Brexit negotiations instead that goes for all parties uh, who have taken umbrage with the democratic decision to leave the European Union De to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, it's time for the SNP to change the narrative, to pragmatically work together with the UK Government to get the best deal and focus on the opportunities. The UK Government is listening, it has guaranteed EU citizens' rights, and we, and we expect the amendments to ensure devolution and the UK's internal market are strengthened and safeguarded. The Scottish Government should now listen too. Thank you very much. I call Polly McNeill to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Ms McNeill, please. Thank you. There is no other issue more important than the Brexit negotiations and the outcome of them. The quality of people's lives, the stability of commerce and business across the UK is dependent on delivering the best arrangements out with the European Union as required by the referendum outcome. Leavers promised better trade deals out of Europe, alternative free, uh, trade deals. There would be a better world out with the EU we have yet to see it. All we had to do was vote for it. The way I see it now was that Brexiteers wanted to leave at all costs and there is no detailed plan, no thought given to where Britain would then remain. And it has to be said, in my opinion, the single most destabilising event following the referendum is the ongoing behaviour of the British Cabinet. It has been an absolute disgrace undermining each other at every turn while we're trying to negotiate a deal for the citizens of the UK. Embarrassing, in fact, on the world stage, refusing to recognise and understand the basics of a negotiation strategy that if we choose to leave, we do have to pay our debts. And I think some measure of good faith should have been courted within the EU. Uh, and one of those could have started with recognising the rights and the needs of EU citizens who should not have to have lived in uncertainty about um, their lives going forward. They have rod ridden roughshod over the Scotland Act that we all, most of us, fought for, grabbing all former EU powers to the centre. No wonder the devolved nations are up in arms as their interests are sidelined, not even to mention the deep concern of our Irish friends across the waters. Uh, I'm opposed to a charge, incidentally, uh, on a fee for those citizens um, to remain. But the disentangling of citizens' rights and financial obligations in the process of disengagement of 40 years of standard setting and regulatory convergence under the single market, of course, is no simple task. But it does necessitate a transition period. To me, that is obvious is a recognition that there are real practicalities that have to be untangled. In fact, I believe we should have argued for a transition period much, much sooner, even if that means that it perpetuates some uncertainty over the final destination. I'm sure that we all in this chamber hope for the best deal that can be achieved. 
and we rightly demand clarity on the shape of Britain out of Europe. There even seems to be some cross-party consensus on this. Uh, even some sensible Tories are fighting for a sensible approach to Brexit. But as someone who voted to remain and someone who also argued to respect the outcome of the Leave decision, I am beginning to lose my patience somewhat. And frankly, I am not prepared to say that it is all up to the Leavers uh, to decide the new relationship. There must be an acceptance that all of us, whether you voted Leave or Remain, must be involved in a democratic process to decide what is best for Britain. And I do not believe that's what's happening. It was Vince Cable who put it quite succinctly when he said this week that Britain's negotiating stance is a disaster. The Brexiteers in the Conservative Party have horribly miscalculated Britain's bargaining power or have not stopped to consider the reality of our bargaining power against the EU27. Uh, EU I think the tone set by Theresa and me and uh, David Davis is flawed. It doesn't seem to try to gain even the respect of the 27 and the Chancellor helpfully believes that they are the enemy. Um, yesterday we had the Tory whip Chris Heaton Harris who has written to all Scottish or sorry all universities um, asking what their respected academics are teaching on European affairs on the question of Brexit. Now I know that number 10 has disassociated themselves and rightly so from that remark. But no wonder respected journalists like John Simpson tweeted yesterday that the daily hate in the press and the behaviour of someone like him who should know better does not make me feel like it's my country anymore. These are the stakes of this Brexit scenario we are in. No deal. And I noticed that the Tory motion does not rule out a no deal. And I, I think that that's unfortunate. As, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the Labour benches are concerned, no deal means the return of a hard border in the Republic of Ireland. It creates barriers to imports. It will create, um, un, well, I think Lewis MacDonald and others have talked at length about the LSE's economic predictions. Uh, so no one to a person could be under any illusion about what a no deal means. In conclusion, uh, presiding officer, um, I, for one, will be watching carefully how these negotiations are. We were told that no deal is better than a bad deal. Well, you do not speak for me and you do not speak for millions of others who stand to lose uh, 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 in the quality of their lives uh, quite substantially if we do not get the best deal for Britain. If we are to honour the vote last June to leave Europe, we had better start recognising that the serious dangers lie ahead for all of us and the biggest one is no deal for Britain. Thank you. Thank you. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Ross Greer. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I want to uh, pick up the contribution of uh, Marie Goujon and look at it from the perspective of UK citizens who are living in the EU. Um, they are not relying on uh, specious promises coming from the Prime Minister or other members of the Westminster administration. Uh, they are applying in considerable numbers uh, for passports from other countries in the EU to which they're available. Indeed, we've seen the rather unexpected uh, site of Ian Paisley Jr. Uh, of the Democratic Unionist Party in Northern Ireland handing out Irish uh, passport application forms uh, to his constituents uh, and to others. Uh, that precisely tells you uh, how difficult the situation is perceived for many. I have uh, members of my own family and close friends uh, who fall into this category. Uh, I have uh, a niece in Sweden. Uh, she is now a Swedish citizen and the holder of a Swedish passport because she can't plan her life on vague promises uh, that can't be banked. She has to assure her future. And incidentally, uh, it's interesting to compare and contrast her experience of becoming a Swedish citizen with the burach that we heard described by Marie Goujon. It actually took her five days to get her Swedish citizenship. Now, she's been resident there for over a decade, I accept that, but five days I thought was a pretty impressive administrative deal. 
Um, my nephew, who lives in Denmark, uh, he has yet to submit his Danish uh, passport application, but is actively contemplating doing so. And four close friends who have the appropriate uh, Irish grandparents are looking to apply for Irish passports. All across Europe, we have uncertainty for UK citizens not reassured in any way, shape or form uh, by what's coming for Westminster. So yes, it's an important point for EU citizens here, but it is equally a significant problem uh, for UK citizens elsewhere. Now, I came to this parliament uh, sworn in on the 13th of June uh, 2001. And the following day, I spoke in my first debate, which was on the European Committee uh, of this Parliament's uh, report on the common fisheries policy. And so I was pitched right into uh, debating on behalf of my constituents some of the very substantial shortcomings of many of the things that come from Europe. And indeed, the European uh, Committee, uh, as its first headline conclusion, uh, from its deliberations said, we believe the current situation is untenable. They were talking about the common fisheries policy. And I think in an env environment where uh, the uh, EU was funding the building of new Spanish boats while simultaneously ensuring that the Scottish fleet was substantially reduced, um, the bitterness that uh, people in the northeast of Scotland and other fishing communities uh, have towards the EU is a perfectly understandable one. But even there, things are changing because it is clear uh, that what was the expectation of fishing communities looks increasingly less likely to be delivered. Yesterday, we had the Scottish Fishermen's Federation uh, advocating in the strongest possible terms that decision-making on fishing policy and practice must remain in Scotland. And of course, that takes us directly to section 11.1 uh, of what might be termed the Great Repeal Bill, although Mr. Tompkins has uh, given us another title for it, uh, which we might adopt if we wish. Um, but the bottom line is, that even the most Eurosceptic are realizing the limitations of what is happening. Michael Gove uh, appears to have promised continuing, quote, relative stability uh, to the Danes and to the Dutch, absolutely at odds uh, with what fishing communities uh, expected. So the negotiations thus far are nothing short of a muddle. The EU, with 27 countries who had to agree a common line, were able to do so pretty rapidly. The UK cabinet, with 23 members, has not been able, after a substantially longer period, to come to any meaningful agreement uh, as to where we are going to go. So, let me give a few hints as to how negotiation might be done. Uh, one of the leading training companies in the negotiation is actually based in Glasgow, and his services are used all over the place. They're a little company called Scotwork, and they have a simple system which is called limit. Three lists, things we would like to get, things we intend to get, and things we must get. And the way you do it is you sit down and you work out what's on your list. Now, you don't disclose your lists publicly. You close them bit by bit through the negotiation process. There is not the slightest sign that anything professional is happening in the negotiating world. Now, let me end, presiding officer. Uh, by welcoming the fact that the Tories in their seven paragraphs of their amendment have provided four that I can actually agree with. And that's a welcome move forward. It's in everybody's interest that negotiations succeed. We want progress to be accelerated. Um, and uh, we welcome the reconvening of the Joint uh, Ministerial Committee. And fundamentally, we're looking to see the Great Repeal Bill amended, because until it is, no progress, meaningfully, will be possible. Presiding officer. Thank you. I call Ross Gear, followed by Willie Rennie. Mr Gear, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The UK is now six months into Brexit negotiations, and progress has been slow. The prospect of a no-deal Brexit has increased in likelihood and in profile throughout this period, particularly in the last few weeks. And we should be clear on what that means. No deal would mean leaving the largest free trade area in the world, one with over 50 operational trade deals, and reverting to World Trade Organization default rules. It's the worst possible outcome. 
And despite, despite the bluster of the Brexiteers, it would be far worse for the UK than for the European Union. Tariffs would be imposed on goods and licensing restrictions on services, causing economic havoc almost immediately. Customs checks would return, leading to chaos at our ports and borders. This is the territory of overnight crisis. The Fraser Valander Institute estimated last year that a no-deal scenario would lead to a long-term £2,000 drop in average wages and a loss of 80,000 jobs in Scotland, as well as £8 billion wiped off the economy. The Minister's already mentioned the numbers in this week's LSE report. We've already suffered a decade of wage erosion as inflation has undermined the value of pay packets across the UK. Now inflation is almost 3%, it's at a five-year high, and expected to rise further as the impact of Brexit takes hold. How much more can workers take? Of course, the situation is far worse for residents here who are citizens of other European nations. In addition to the broader economic threats, they're used as bargaining chips and see their rights under threat. It's disgraceful that the UK government has continued to refuse to genuinely guarantee the rights of European citizens. Theresa May claims that it's necessary to protect UK nationals living in the EU, but this is just nonsense. UK nationals living in the EU have written directly to the Prime Minister, begging her to stop treating citizens' rights as an immigration issue and guarantee the rights of EU citizens living in the UK. Spain, the EU state with the largest number of UK nationals, has already taken steps to unilaterally guarantee the rights of UK nationals. This fear and anxiety was created by this Conservative government and it continues to be stoked by this government. The offer they've put forward on EU citizens' rights falls far short of being acceptable. It tears up current laws on family rights and instead imposes a minimum income threshold on family unification, basing the right to a family life on your ability to secure a high income. Do those with the least wealth not deserve their rights, not deserve their right to a family life? It also includes restrictions on leave to remain, preventing people from leaving the UK for more than two years. These are rules which saw a woman originally from Singapore, married to a British man of 27 years, the mother of two British sons, deported because she'd been in Singapore too long caring for her elderly mother. Why does this offer to EU citizens have to be so bad? This is a product of Theresa May's deliberate efforts as Home Secretary to create a hostile environment in an attempt to restrict and reduce immigration. Her cat-handed policies have targeted everyone from turning doctors and nurses into immigration enforcers to sending the racist go-home vans to areas with high ethnic minority populations. And it was Theresa May's own former colleague, George Osborne, who revealed that she single-handedly blocked a guarantee for EU citizens in the immediate aftermath of the Brexit vote. I've seen firsthand the impact that this has had on real people. Last month, I met EU citizens living here in Scotland at the Language Hub in Glasgow. They told me of the new discriminations that they're uh, encountering already. They've been singled out, asked to prove that they're entitled to NHS healthcare when attending maternity appointments because their name sounded a bit foreign. They've seen flats advertised to rent for UK nationals only. They've struggled to find jobs because employers have become reluctant to even interview, to even consider EU citizens. This is the hostile environment that's been created by Theresa May one which many non-European nationals have been suffering through for years. All of this, of course, is made even worse by the EU withdrawal bill. The bill provides far-reaching powers to ministers to change the law, including acts of parliament covering basic rights through secondary legislation. That means changes to the law by ministerial discretion without even a vote in parliament, as the explanatory notes accompanying the bill explain. Healthy democracies do not permit a government this kind of power especially without appropriate parliamentary scrutiny. But this is par for the course, with a government uh, which only this morning took the position in committee uh, through David Davis, the Brexit Secretary, that the UK Parliament may not even get a vote on the final Brexit deal until after we leave. Again, not a position that a healthy democracy should be in, not healthy respect, particularly in a country which has a constitutional tradition of parliamentary sovereignty. Presiding officer, it is paramount that the UK government rules out a no-deal scenario and immediately, immediately provides assurances to EU citizens living in the UK. That's 180,000 people living in Scotland, 3 million across the whole of the UK who need and who deserve that assurance. In the not much longer term, however, we need to move forward towards the full devolution of migration and asylum policies to ensure that in Scotland at least, basic rights can be respected, we can build a system that we're proud of for the kind of welcoming country, country that we want to be and a system which supports our economic needs. We know in Scotland through decades of depopulation that immigration has been a fantastic way to revive communities and reverse that trend. 
we still aspire to be a welcoming, outward-looking nation. While the Brexiteers tell us to look inward, throw accusations at those they perceive as lacking in patriotism, and try to keep the public and sometimes parliament in the dark, this parliament, at least, can send a message that we still live in the real world, that we stand up for the interests of all those that we represent, and we will not consent to this process going any further forward until the UK government does the same. I call Willie Rennie to be followed by Richard Lockhead. From day one, this was bad news, also because most of my funding has come from the EU. When the government announced that the status of EU citizens would be part of the negotiations, my decision to leave became final. If I would talk about our dogs that way, my spouse would kick me out of the house. These are the words of a professor an EU national who previously lived in Scotland for more than 10 years, but has already moved elsewhere in the EU because of Brexit. I am ashamed that someone of such standing and education believed he has been treated like a dog by our government, like a dog. We should treat people like we would like to be treated ourselves. The words of the professor are included in a report by the Royal Society of Edinburgh, Young Academy of Scotland. He is one of many who has spoken about the personal and professional impact of Brexit. It is a heartbreaking read. The report shows that much damage has already been done. Many are leaving or want to leave. And the kind of assurances that were on the verge of an agreement by the Conservatives have something we've heard for months but you'd be not surprised that people are rather sceptical about the words from the Conservatives on these matters when nothing turns up in words that gives them any kind of reassurance. No practical agreement. But it's the damage that could yet be inflicted that I fear too. The negotiations have been a car crash in slow motion. Now, you'll remember Liam Fox told us the EU negotiations would be one of the easiest in human history. Now we know why he has been given a department with no responsibility. It is little wonder that if you treat people from other European countries like this, that Brexit discussions with those very same countries have not gone well. What have the Conservatives got to show for 15 months of negotiations? The EU have shredded our £350 million a week invoice for the NHS and sent one back to the tune of billions. And the Conservatives once claimed the EU would be desperate to trade with us. Now they are openly praising a no-deal option. And Adam Tompkins complains that other people are raising the no-deal option. It wasn't us that raised the no-deal option. It was members of his own party, including ministers, who raised the no-deal option. So if it's not on the table, why on earth did they raise it in the first place? And to claim that a no-deal option would be a good idea is, going, is actually to abandon the EHIC health insurance card, the Erasmus scheme, the European Research Area, the Euratom, the European Arrest Warrant, and so many other benefits. No deal would mean that Canada would have a better trading relationship with the EU than the UK. In fact, there are 44 different countries that have some form of agreement with the EU, including South Korea, South Africa, Mexico, Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan. If there's no deal, all of those countries, thousands of miles away, will have better relations with the EU than the UK. A former member only 20 miles away. And Adam Tompkins mumbles from a sedentary position, which should be no problem to reach an agreement. Well, why on earth? are his own ministers raising the possibility of a no-deal Brexit because they are trying to use it as a threat. But you never use a threat that isn't got any credibility. It must have credibility before you raise it or that lack of credibility reflects upon the negotiator. And that's exactly what has happened with this government. Now, the impact of a no-deal Brexit would be significant. Barnsmuir Farm is near Crail. At peak... It needs 270 workers to harvest the fruit and veg it grows, but they've been struggling to get the workforce they need already. Their workers have faced a pay cut 
because of the fall in the value of the pound. The distance from home and the Scottish weather become more important when you don't get paid as much. And they are wondering whether Britain really wants them when they hear that immigrants are a problem. The growth at Barnes Muir has come with the advance of technology and the availability of good workers. Longer picking seasons mean a greater demand for pickers. Even if every available East Fife worker was to step forward, there would still not be enough of them to meet the demands of the seasonal work. In 10 years, the food and drink sector has grown 44% to £14 billion. That is going to rise to £30 billion by 2030. But if they don't have the workforce to feed the industry, that simply will not happen. Now, we've heard about the LSE report, the dramatic impact of £30 billion. We know that universities like St Andrews have got a great reliance on university staff from EU countries. A fifth of the research grants come from the EU. It would be a devastating impact if we're not got any kind of agreement on all of those areas. And that's why to raise the prospect of a no deal, I think, is irresponsible. If the Conservatives want an alternative option to a bad deal, they should let the British people decide whether the deal is good enough or not. For such a monumental decision, it should not be left to the shambolic Conservative cabinet to determine whether the deal is acceptable. Once the detail is known, there should be a referendum to endorse or otherwise. The option of remaining in the EU should be on the ballot paper. Donald Tusk, the President of the Council, has said that that's possible this week. He made that clear to MEPs. And I would urge the government to give the British people the right to turn back if they choose to. Let's start pe treating people with respect. Must close, give them Mr. the Rennie. final say. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I have Richard Lockhead to be followed by Peter Chapman. It is quite remarkable that as we debate this today in late 2017, we remain as much in the dark today as to what a Brexit deal will look like as we were the day after the EU referendum back in June 2016. Theresa May's set piece speeches, they seem to come and go, but we don't seem to move, move much forward. Despite some comforting words we have heard from UK ministers, the EU nationals in this country don't feel any more secure or that they have any more clarity or certainty since last year, as eloquently highlighted by Mary Goujon and other speakers. And there's no certainty for companies wanting to decide their investment plans or contingency plans for 2018 and beyond, as highlighted by Michael Russell. And I would commend Douglas Fraser's article on the BBC website, it's just appeared in the last hour or two, giving an insight to the debates that are taking place within the business community at the moment. He quotes Karen Briggs, the head of Brexit at KPMG, who says in the article, we're seeing businesses quietly stockpiling inventory and exploring alternative sources of talent whilst nervously pushing bigger financial decisions into the new year. And she goes on to say in her quotes that things are probably worse, a lot worse than the financial sector. She says, here the conversation has moved on from high level analysis and impact plans to much more detailed work on setting up an EU presence and the very human issues associated with moving people overseas. And the theme of the article is about the concerns in the business community over the lack of progress, the three T's as the article refers to, transition, trade and talent. So as we approach the end of 2018 and as the exit date of March 2019 gets closer, there is as much confusion today as ever about the UK government's strategy. Last week, we heard David Davis say that no deal must be an option. But Amber Rudd says no deal is unthinkable. But Liam Fox says we have no need to fear a no deal scenario. So chaos and confusion reigns in the UK cabinet. I honestly think we've got the worst political leadership in the House of Commons in history since the House of Commons was built in 1341 by King Edward III, the King of England. But the worrying thing is the prospect of no deal is now being talked up by UK ministers. May famously said that no deal is better than the bad deal, but for Scotland, no deal is the worst deal. Leaving the single market, the customs union, leaving our EU nationals in limbo and reverting to World Trade Organization rules with tariffs crippling some of our key sectors in Scotland, particularly the food and drink sector, uh, as highlighted by Willie Rennie. And that will damage our economy. 
If barriers to trade are erected in March 2019 and the free movement of labour is stopped, then this would be a hammer blow to firms across Scotland. I know that will be a hammer blow to firms, particularly in my own constituency and in the food processing sector. Jim Walker of Walker Shortbread and Aberlour just said um, a few weeks ago the impact of the UK's decision to leave the European Union in 2019, with all that means for our ability to trade freely with Europe and to draw in a wider pool of labour, is a source of considerable uncertainty. And we've seen the price of imports to the food and drink sector rocket due to the plunging pound that's taken place since the EU vote. And we also have to know the scale of the damage. The, the UK government have these impact assessments. They're not disclosing them. They're not putting them in the public domain. Perhaps David Mundell, the Secretary of State for Scotland, could, could help Scotland in this regard and use his 70-strong propaganda unit in the Scotland office to actually stand up for Scotland and argue for these assessments to be put in the public domain. But we do know that a hard Brexit or no deal will cost Scotland very, very deal. In fact, potentially billions of pounds of Scottish taxpayers' cash is going to be used to buy our way out of the EU when 62% of the people of Scotland voted to remain within the EU. And we're actually going to set to pay that for the privilege of then losing hundreds of millions of pounds of EU funds. And then there's the economic damage that will arise from leaving the single market. So that's a triple financial whammy that will hit Scotland because we will be taken out of the EU against our will and Scotland didn't vote for that. And this Parliament's energies should be spent on rebuilding our economy after the economic crash in 2009, as we've all been doing over these past few years. But now we face years of dealing with the fallout of a hard Brexit or no deal and all the damage that will leave within its wake. We should really be spending our time addressing the challenges of the 21st century that faces our society and our country. The lack of progress between the UK and the EU is going to make that a lot more difficult. And the lack of progress also between the Scottish Government and the UK Government is going to make that a lot more difficult. Scottish ministers are quite rightly seeking amendments to the EU withdrawal bill to protect devolution and our powers. And as Stuart Stevenson said, even the Scottish Fishermen's Federation are expressing concern about a power grab to the UK Government. And no wonder, because we know they're going to dress up international fisheries negotiations as foreign affairs and grab that power and keep it reserved. And likewise, our farmers have been told there should be a UK framework for agriculture because the UK government, as uh, confirmed by Damien Green, do not want Scottish farmers having the advantage over English farmers. And that will be their motivation in that as well. And my final comment is that to address these challenges, we have to make more progress in gaining new powers to the Scottish Parliament. As Ross Greer said, particularly over immigration. Over the next 25 years, the number of pensionable age and over in Murray, in my constituency, is projected to increase by 33%. At the same time, the population of the working age people is expected to decrease by 3%. And the number of children by 8%. That is worse than the situation facing Scotland, but the situation facing Scotland is still also a huge challenge. We need powers over immigration, and that's why immigration is a much bigger feature of the Brexit debate in Scotland than it is in the rest of the UK, where the figures of the demographic trends are not nearly as challenging as what they are facing Scotland. So I wish the, I wish the Minister the best of luck. I hope Parliament will rally around uh, the motion today, and I hope we show more unity in terms of the, addressing the threat to Scotland from Brexit than what we see in the UK Cabinet at the current time. <clears throat> I call Peter Chapman to be followed by Claire Hawkey. Deputy President Officer, and uh, once again I refer members to my register of interest as far as farming is concerned. I would like to bring a bit of positive thinking into this debate today, which seems to have been brought to the Parliament by the SNP as another opportunity to continue criticism of the UK Government. I acknowledge the Brexit, Brexit vote brings uncertainty. But I also welcome the opportunities it has to bring, and I wish the Scottish Government could do the same, and for once positively focus on the future of Scotland and the UK post-Brexit. And what a boost it would be if Mike Russell and Willie Rennie and Richard Lockhead could cheer up a bit about Brexit. The whole three of them remind me of Ricky Fulton's character, the Reverend I Am Jolly. All doom, gloom, and despondency. I move on. <laughs> One of the most important sectors of Scotland's food industry is our fishing sector. And this industry has the potential to flourish post-Brexit, and the Scottish Government should be grasping this opportunity with both hands. 
The Scottish Fishermen's Federation has been extremely vocal about the sea of opportunity that exists post-Brexit. The SFF have stated the catching sector of the Scottish fishing industry is united in its conviction that exit from the EU presents a unique set of opportunities for Scotland to reinvigorate its coast, coastal and island communities. This government needs to listen to the fishermen of Scotland. Scotland's seas are some of the most productive, valuable and diverse fisheries anywhere in the world. And our ability to claim our 200 nautical miles of the EEZ will allow Scotland to monitor and control our fisheries free from the dead hand of Brussels, ensuring our own fishermen can increase their catch. Surely not even the SNP can, can uh, think it's fair that 60% of the fish in our waters are caught by foreign boats. The increased fish landings we can expect to see also means the growth of our fish processing sector, reversing the decline we are currently seeing and creating more jobs around the country. The sea of opportunity is real, and it is time the Scottish Government showed their support. Absolutely. Gillian Martin. Peter, you, 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 um, sorry, Peter, Mr Chapman, you come from an area which has quite a lot of fish processing plants. Have you visited them and found out what percentage of employees come from other EU countries? Can I remind members who should always speak through the chair, Peter Absolutely Chapman. I have, and I recognise that many of them come from the EU, and that is why we are working hard to allow them to continue to come in. Absolutely. I understand the uncertainty the industry faced upon, the, and far, as far as farming is concerned, I understand the uncertainty that the industry faced upon the news that would be leaving the EU, especially here in Scotland. With less favoured area land making up 85% of our farmland, maybe we have more to worry about. However, Michael Gove has been clear that funding for our farmers will remain at current levels in the, until at least 2022. That's fine. However, the big prize is that with a blank sheet of paper, we can design a system of support that is far better targeted to our farmers' needs. It must be easier to apply for, easier to administer, and it must deliver the support to those who supply and grow our fine food. And at the same time, it needs to protect our environment. Fergus Ewan has a duty to bring forward plans as to what this new mechanism looks like. To date, there has been nothing but a deafening silence. Clearly, he must do better. It seems he wants the powers, but not the responsibility. I believe we need an overarching UK structure within which Scotland's farmers can continue to do its own thing. We want to get the best possible deal for our farmers to retain the same powers over agriculture here in Holyrood and protect our single UK market, which despite Joan McAlpine's recent daft assertions is worth four times more than our trade with the EU. Scotland has many fine farmers, hardworking, technically efficient, with high standards and open to change. Change is imperative as the farming industry moves beyond Brexit and into the future. We have the opportunity to help this key industry evolve, investing in new ways to help improve productivity, efficiency and resilience. A continuing focus on good environmental practice in the move away from the CAP system is also important. Every farmer I have ever spoken to wants to retain high environmental standards. But first and foremost, his aim in life is to produce high quality food and be paid fairly for it. He needs to be profitable to be environmentally aware. You can't be green if you are in the red. <laughs> Finally, presiding officer, the Conservative government is striving hard for a good deal with our EU neighbours, delivering the best possible access to our markets and tariff-free trading. And that is exactly what we want to achieve. However, the option of a no deal must remain a possibility. Running my own business, listen to somebody who knows about doing deals. Yeah, right. Running my own business for the last 40 years means I have done lots of deals and I know you can only get the best deal if the other side thinks you might walk away. And I believe it is only since we have talked up this possibility that we have seen some real movement from the EU. I'm glad to have had the opportunity to speak positively in today's debate, highlighting the opportunities for There's no time, um... these key industries in Scotland. But I must make clear that I strongly disagree with the Scottish Government's current position. 
in a time when the UK should be united and strong close, Mr. in our desire for the best possible deal for everyone. The SNP is continuing to berate and undermine the UK negotiations. You must close, Mr. Chapman. I would just like to say that. No, Mr. Chapman, you must close, please. I will close. And uh, can I say to your colleagues that it's up to the presiding officer to decide on the length of the speeches? Thank you very much, Mr. Tompkins. And we move to the last contribution in the open debate, and that's Claire Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I hope the Chamber will forgive me for approaching this debate from a health perspective. And as such, I duly refer members to my entry in the Register of Interests as a registered mental health nurse and to my honorary contract with Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS. Apart from the most hardened of Brexiteers, surely no one can doubt or deny the potential that Brexit will have anything but a profoundly adverse effect on our health sector. Indeed, in an article published in The Lancet last month, the authors concluded that no matter whether Brexit is soft, hard or failed, then it will still pose a substantial threat to our NHS. Our health sector and, of course, all other sectors must be protected during the Brexit process. And that's why it's vital that the Scottish Government's voice is heard and has meaningful influence alongside the other devolved nations in the negotiations. Although matters pertaining to health are largely devolved to the Scottish Parliament, there are still many important areas which are reserved to Westminster, be that embryology, surrogacy and genetics, or xenotransplantation, or the working hours of healthcare staff through the provisions of the Working Time Directive. There's no escaping the fact that our health service can be directly affected through any negotiations. It is incredibly worrying that the government leading this process is one which appears utterly clueless, is rife with infighting and is in complete denial about the possible effects of Brexit, particularly on our NHS. Through an answer to a written question tabled to the Tory government by MP Justin Madders, the UK government confirmed that they were not able to disclose the number of officials in the department for exiting the European Union who were health experts. If they don't know such basic information as who in their workforce are experts in health, then how can we trust them to prioritise such a sector during these negotiations? The Tory government's biggest mistake during this process so far is clearly that it has not guaranteed the rights of EU citizens living in the UK and vice versa. It's not only the Scottish government who are demanding Tories safeguard the rights of EU nationals, their partners and dependents living in the UK, but leading charities like Cancer Research UK. It's absolutely appalling that rather than doing so, the Westminster government are pushing ahead with plans to force EU nationals to apply and to pay for settled status. There are up to 20,000 EU nationals who work in Scotland's hospitals, in the social care sector, in schools and our other public agencies. And the contribution they make to Scotland is overwhelmingly positive. These EU nationals have made Scotland and the UK their home. So the Prime Minister should do the honourable thing and abandon this proposal. In our speech on Monday, during the European Council statement, the Prime Minister stated that the fee for this will cost no more than a UK passport. Well, currently an adult's passport costs £72.50, whilst a child's passport costs £46. So for a family of four on the UK government's living wage, they'll need to work 32 hours, a full week's wages, to pay to apply for settled status. In stark contrast, this Scottish Government will ensure that EU citizens who work in the Scottish public sector will have their fees paid for them. The SNP Scottish Government treats EU nationals with compassion and care, and the Westminster Tories treat them as bargaining chips. As widely reported this week, Almost £30 billion will be wiped off the Scottish economy in five years if the UK government fail to reach a deal with the European Union, as per the research undertaken by the London School of Economics. Through these figures, my Rutherglen constituency's local authority area, South Lanarkshire, would be worse off by a staggering £1.3 billion. As such, no deal is not an option. Further research carried out by the Brexit Healthcare Alliance, an organisation comprising of patient groups, charities, NHS bodies, medical research and industry groups, found that a no-deal Brexit that ends healthcare arrangements between the UK and the EU could end up costing national health services across the UK £500 million a year. 
It also found that travel insurance for trips to Europe may become unaffordable for people with existing health problems. While the NHS could face additional pressures if British citizens living abroad were no longer able to access reciprocal health care. The Nuffield Trust estimates that an extra 190,000 people could require hospital beds if the, in the UK if such health care arrangements are scrapped, creating incredible demands for doctors, nurses, healthcare professionals and support staff. Presiding officer, another major issue which requires attention is our future relationship with the European Medicines Agency post-Brexit. Notwithstanding the fact that it is the largest EU organisation based in the UK and that it employs 900 staff, but thanks to its existence, UK residents have access to new treatments and drugs up to six months earlier than in some other countries like Canada and Australia. Through the EMA, pharmaceutical companies only need to submit a single application, which, when granted, allows that particular treatment to be licensed throughout the EU and the EEA. Having no deal and ending a relationship with institutes like the EMA is not an option we can consider if our population is to have timely and safe access to new drugs and new treatments. Presiding officer, we need a deal to ensure that EU nationals can continue to live in Scotland and to work in our NHS. We need a deal to ensure that reciprocal healthcare arrangements are in place and we need a deal to ensure that our economy is not irreparably damaged. We now move to the closing speeches and I call... No, that's not acceptable. No interventions from the gallery. Thank you very much. Right, I call Daniel Johnson. Up to six minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The very fact that there is a need for this debate is telling in itself. The fact that we have to have a motion setting out that we cannot contemplate a no-deal scenario, despite the economic consequences, despite the human consequences, is quite unbelievable. The fact that we have to say that we don't want to trade on citizens' rights is quite I would have said before now, uncontemplatable. The fact that we have to say that bringing forward a bill that tramples on the devolution settlement, that brings forward hitherto uh, unseen powers to ministers to amend legislation as they see fit, is quite unbelievable. And above all else, the fact that we need to assert that there needs to be democratic accountability on the final deal is something I did not think that we would have to do. Indeed, I campaigned for a Remain vote, and while I could contemplate the outcome might be otherwise, what I found much more difficult to deal with is the nature and the path that the Conservative government has taken since that vote 18 months ago. But indeed, perhaps it's worth telling that some of the new words and terminology that we've had to get to grips with. And my favourite one in recent days has been wing sprouters, summarising the position that those people who believe in a hard Brexit believe that we should launch ourselves off the cliff expecting the wings to sprout to save us from the cliff's blow. And it reveals a telling truth, that they believe in faith over fact. Indeed, I think the whole Conservative government has adopted that position. Split between those people who are true believers and the doomsayers resigned to the inevitability of the poor outcome. And I hear the conciliatory words coming from the Conservatives in this place today, but the reality is their colleagues are, form, are part of a discredited government, devoid of leadership and without a plan for Brexit. But we have a moment here. It's been 18 months since that vote and a year and a half left. <coughs> there is time to change, time to take different course of action and pursue a different plan. Now, we can talk in numbers, in economics, about the reality of Brexit, but it's the human cost, the human impact of this, which I think are most telling. And I couldn't have put it better than Mary Goujon. I think her story about the challenges she's facing in new married life, I think, are telling. The fact that anyone gets, you know, coming to, to grips with new married life, with all its uh, excitement, but also new things, has to deal with the uncertainty of citizenship is quite unbelievable. And indeed, it's something that I've experienced in my own constituency. I held a meeting recently on Brexit, and one lady who was from Spain but lived in Scotland for the last 20 years put it very well indeed that these are our rights. They're not the government's rights to be trading. They're our rights, and you cannot take them away from us. Now, I'm sorry 
to, uh, if Adam Tompkins feels that that is carping from the sidelines. I call that standing up for principle, and it's something that his government should listen to. But more than that, I think Willie Rennie put it very well. Pursuing such an approach isn't just wrong in terms of citizenships. It undermines the very Brexit negotiations that the government seeks to pursue. Because it frankly uh, uh, shows a degree of lack of faith, a lack of trust, that erodes the negotiations themselves. But we shouldn't be surprised because we're a quarter of the way through. And where are we? We have begging phone calls from the Prime Minister. We have uh, the, the government flying out the Cabinet to Florence to listen to speeches. We see the pound devalued by a quarter, making us all poorer. And businesses writing to the Prime Minister, seeking urgent clarification on transition deals by Christmas, otherwise they are going to have to put their contingency plans into place. This is a shambolic approach to Brexit. There are three elements you need for negotiation. You need trust, you need a clear and realistic plan, and you need a coherent team. This government has none of those things. They have lost the trust through the, their approach to uh, citizens' rights. They have no clear and realistic plan because they are playing a game of chicken with a no Brexit deal that has no credibility. Because the reality is this. While the government may be playing a game of chicken, the reality is we are on a push bike and the EU is on an HGV. The realities, the consequences of a no Brexit deal for the UK are just simply not commensurate with the, the, those of the EU. The impact on our economy will be so much greater, do so much more harm, that it is simply not a credible position to adopt. But, but, uh, but most importantly, it's not just the trust with the EU countries, it's trust with our family of nations within the United Kingdom. The fact that they are contemplating a deal that undermines the devolution sentiment, I think is most worrying of all. This structure of reserved and devolved powers, so carefully and I think very cleverly put together in the Scotland Act, is I think one of, one of the things that we should be very proud of in Scotland with our devolution settlement. And the fact that the Brexit bill contemplates undermining that, I find deeply worrying indeed. And many people have described in, at length the, the cost of a no Brexit deal. And the £30 billion set out by the LSE is one thing, but it's also the time that it would take to set up new trade deals. The fact that our trade, half of which is in services, would mean that setting up those trade deals won't just take a matter of a year, two years, or even three. They will take five years or more in order to set up. Take us well beyond the, the trajectory of any proposed transition deals. Presiding officer, the reality of this is that despite the conciliatory tone of the Tories, both in the debate and in their amendment, that Peter Chapman somewhat let the cat out of the bag. No deal is an option. They are contemplating it. They are uh, uh, looking at, at coming out of this with no deal whatsoever, despite the cost that it would have on our economy, on our people. The reality is we must reject a no deal Brexit. We must protect our current trade arrangements. We must protect the devolution settlement. And we must have, and as an absolute a red line, and the democratic accountability close, of bringing the final deal before the UK Parliament to be voted on democratically. Paul Jackson. Carlaw, up to seven minutes, please, Mr Carlaw. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin where the debate started with the contribution from the Minister, uh, Mike Russell, and can I thank him for the contribution? I actually felt that uh, after a few more belligerent exchanges between us over time, that this afternoon's contribution was actually measured and constructive. And I believe that is largely because uh, both he and the Conservatives mm -hmm. of this side either represent or work with governments who are actually charged with achieving an outcome in this process, which is, however we voted in the referendum last year, that we achieve a deal which is in the best interest of Scotland and the United Kingdom. And I'll quote back to Mr. Russell what he said, Scotland did not vote for uh, this outcome, nor would Scotland probably vote for it again. I did not vote for us to leave the European Union. And let me be quite clear, because I hear this question put from time to time to people, I still wouldn't vote to leave the European Union if the referendum that we have had behind us still lay ahead. Um, but I listen inter with interest to the contribution from many because I cannot think of any treaty negotiation in my lifetime 
which one quarter into the negotiating period, all parties have come and said, this is going absolutely splendidly. We are absolutely convinced that we are all in agreement. This is all going to arrive at a, an outcome which we can, at this stage, predict is going to be a fabulous success and everybody is going to be satisfied. I cannot remember the negotiation of that character that took place. Indeed, I'm old enough to remember the discussions we had in what was probably the largest negotiation we were involved in before this one, and that was the entry into the European Union in the 1970s, and I can remember the language in due course. There was a considerable challenge. Small progress has been made. There's a shocking lack of clarity. How can Mr. Heath possibly think he's ever going to negotiate an entry agreement into the European Union, said Mr. Wilson. I'll achieve a far better outcome if I get... You know, I, I, I'm too many times down memory lane with you, Mr. Stevenson, to go there again just now. But I, I, that was the language that was employed then and that an agreement, agreement was reached. And I accept that this is an extremely fraught and difficult uh, negotiation. And let me also say that I don't believe that the deal that will finally be negotiated can possibly enjoy the support of everybody, because there are many people who don't want to leave the European Union. There are liberals who voted for the referendum to take place, but who as a smug political elite did not believe the people would ever then reject the advice that the liberals gave, and have subsequently <laughs> sought to walk away from the fact that liberal MPs at Westminster voted for the referendum to take place, which has put us in the position we are in today. Mr Rennie. Willie Rennie. Uh, as part of the smug political elite, can I ask him a question? Um, does Jackson Carlow believe the negotiations are going well? Jackson Carlow. It actually matters little what I believe, but the European Committee, the European Committee were in Brussels, and I think there is an interesting difference between the political theatre, which I understand the Labour Party want to pretend it would all be being conducted much better if Jeremy Corbyn were in charge, not a proposition with which many people uh, can readily support, and the SNP, who in fairness voted against the referendum, never wanted us to be in this position at all, uh, stood against the referendum of the people, curiously when they want a referendum and so many other matters to be put to the people, uh, have a different position. But th th we were in the European, we were in Brussels, we were in Brussels and we had an opportunity to meet the diplomats who are actually involved in the negotiation. And Mr Barnier believes we will get to a deal, however difficult it will be. We met privately with other people who are intimately involved in the negotiations, diplomats and others, and it's impressive to see the actual progress which is being made. So I understand the political theatre, but I also believe that there is an underlying drive towards getting an agreement which, as I've said, unfortunately, will not in the end please everybody. But there are two or three things I do want to come back to. Uh, the issue of the European citizens, I've heard many people repeatedly say again there should be a unilateral declaration. That's not going to happen. Uh, and we are now at a much more advanced stage. The Prime Minister said this would be our first priority. It was the first issue that we raised. It's the issue in which both sides now agree we are very near, very close to agreement upon. And a unilateral agreement does not secure the future of British and Scottish nationals elsewhere in the European Union. And it is the security of all people, whether here or whether in the European Union, that it is important that we secure. But Mr Tompkins, I think, made two important points that it is worth returning to. One is, in the whole of this debate this afternoon, and while I've been in Europe, or whether anybody else has, there's talk of progress in EU citizens' rights. There's talk of progress on Northern Ireland. Where there is a stumbling block is on money. No SNP, no Labour, no Green, yeah. no Liberal had anything to say about the divorce bill whatsoever or what their opinion is on what would be an acceptable sum within the negotiation for us to arrive at. And I think it is, it is telling that the Scottish Government has been silent on this. Now, we have been informed, advised by informed sources in the European Union that Nicola Sturgeon has actually been supportive on the view that there is not a great difference of opinion between the Scottish Government and the UK Government on the monies that are involved in this negotiation. But it would be helpful if that silent support, if it is true, was made more public. I also want, in conclusion, to refer to the point that Mr. Tompkins made about the whole discussion about the withdrawal bill and Clause 11. It's a couple of months now since Mr. Russell made an appeal to all sides in this chamber, and to which I believe Scottish Conservatives responded, to work to understand the concerns of the Scottish Government with the withdrawal bill, and to seek to arrive at a point where all parties in this chamber felt that they could lend it their support. And we accept that at the heart of all of that, the Scottish Government's principal concern is with Clause 11. And I think it's important to draw attention to the remarks that Mr. Tompkins made 
in identifying the comments of the Secretary of State for Scotland that, uh, that the powers, the 111 powers that the Scottish Government have identified will either end up with the Scottish Parliament or be subject to a UK framework to which the Scottish Government is a party. There has been an acceptance, an acceptance of a key point that Scottish Government ministers made to us and to others that these uh, new frameworks must be agreed and not imposed. So I believe that there is progress between those who are involved in trying to arrive at an agreement, even though there is a lot of work still to be done here, as there is within the European Union. But just to simply indulge in political theatre is to highlight, I think, the irrelevance of those who chose to make their contribution in that regard to the debate this afternoon. What is important is we understand further what the actual position of many in this Parliament is on the key budgetary negotiation about which so little was said as we reach the agreement which none of us actually sought, but which we all need to ensure we are able to achieve. I call Mike Russell to, to close the debate. Uh, I'd appreciate eight minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I start by saying that I think that there has been, with uh, two exceptions, which I shall come to later, an interesting solidarity in this debate, even in some elements of the Tory party. Um, because people in this chamber do realise how damaging a no deal would be. Even those Tories who tried to justify it, I, I can't honestly believe, uh, could expect anything other than severe damage, as the figures show. The Chamber does recognise how destructive the current EU withdrawal bill would be if it were not changed. And I do welcome the ch different tone that has come from at least two of the three people on the Tory front bench uh, about this matter, because I think it does reflect a seriousness of purpose, as Jackson Carlos indicated, a focus on outcomes, which we have to be focused on to take this issue forward. I think everybody in this changer, chamber realises how inhuman the current approach to EU citizens actually is and the fact that this could be rectified at a stroke of a pen. It is a pity, that I think, that Jackson Carlow says it won't be done, but it could be done. I think it's interesting how we all realise how wasteful and purposeless this activity is. Brexit is taking a huge amount of time and effort that could be well applied to other subjects. And if I can just bring up the final point that's made, uh, Jackson Carlow and Adam Tompkins raised the issue of money saying it was the key issue at this stage. I think we all realise that. But the Scottish Government has actually taken a, a useful stance in saying uh, we do not think that interfering in this matter would be helpful to anyone. We have said that there is a legal as well as a moral obligation. The UK Government did not say there was a legal obligation until recently, but we've been trying to be useful and helpful in not intervening in some areas where that would be a purposeless activity, which actually which actually would make things more difficult. And that's also been our situation in terms of the Northern Irish settlement. We have very clearly said we agree with the intention to resolve the Northern Irish situation by having no border, particularly no hard border, but it would not be helpful for us to get involved in that in a detailed way, and we won't get involved in that in a detailed way at this stage. So I think we've shown responsibility in these matters, and I hope that might be welcomed on the Conservative benches. Now, I have to say that Regrettably, we can't support the Tory amendment. As Stuart Stevenson has said, there are things in it which are very welcome, things with which one can agree. But we cannot agree with the, the element of no deal in the, in the amendment. And we do want to see concrete progress on the issues of amendments to the bill. But I am gl glad that the other parties can agree on the resolution. And I think that takes us a big step along a, a difficult road. Now, there have been some tremendous contributions in this debate. I want to pick out at the very beginning that from uh, Marie Goujon. I think she gave us the human face of what the situation is to do with EU nationals. It is a very, very difficult situation, and Willie Rennie pointed that out too in the quote that he gave from uh, a professor in Scotland. It is a very, very difficult personal situation that people find themselves in. Uh, and finding a way in which we can support those individuals in Scotland has been difficult. The Scottish Government continues to develop its support mechanisms. People usually go to UK websites to get support. We want to make sure that they get more support in Scotland itself. But we also want to talk positively about the nature of migration. And that's what we're going to do. We've been trying to do it uh, across the country and we're going to do more of it in the next few months to show how important migration is to Scotland. And as Ross Greer pointed out quite correctly, migration also builds communities in Scotland, particularly in places where population is falling. So migration is an unalloyed good to Scotland. And we're going to say that regularly and often. And I was very struck also by Marie Goujon's point about the exploitation of EU citizens. Uh, this is a, a shocking development. And that is an issue 
which the UK government could deal with with a stroke of the pen. And I'm urging them, even now, to use that pen. And there are a range of other useful and important points made. Lewis MacDonald made the very important point for Michel Barnier that there is no status quo. A no deal plunges, plunges the UK into a completely unknown set of circumstances. Uh, a point that Pauline McNeill made too with particular reference to Ireland because it would create the hardest of borders in those circumstances. And Richard Lockhead made some very, very important points about the financial sector. I've met people in the financial sector who are preparing to leave, who have made decisions to leave. And that is exceptionally worrying too. Now, there were good contributions that I disagree with. Adam Tompkins made a number of points which I think were important. I just don't find myself in agreement with them. Um, I have to say that the point he made about the sequencing of the talks is inaccurate. There was an agreement between the UK and the EU that the talks would follow the sequence exactly as laid out. And of course, the EU believed it was laid out in Article 50. And that is what has been taking place. The divorce bill, the legal and moral obligations, the issue of Northern Ireland, the EU citizens, and issues to do with ECJ and some other issues like the Crown Base in Cyprus. That is the sequence that was agreed. Nobody imposed that upon the UK government. And working that through was what the UK government said they would do. But uh, I have to say there were two outliers in this debate, two uh, Tory MSPs who clearly didn't get the front bench memo, even though one of them is sitting on the front bench, which is a bit surprising. Uh, and uh, both were depressing contributions, I have to say. Uh, Rachel Hamilton doesn't understand the difference between a unified and a uniform market. But more importantly, as somebody with a business background, uh, she doesn't understand the extraordinary difficulty that Brexit is already causing uh, for people even in her own area of expertise. I've had many representations in the hospitality sector. I've had many representations. Yesterday, I was meeting the soft food sector. There is a developing crisis in the labor force. And to say this existed before Brexit and in some way was of no consequence at all is an absolute misrepresentation of the facts that are being given by business themselves. And then we had the contribution from uh, Mr. Chapman, who is becoming the Doric Donald Trump. <laughs> I, I know, he says, how to do deals. I have to say, I thought it was an arrogant and unpleasant contribution. It was a contribution on behalf, it was a, con well, I heard it. Some members did not hear it. I would advise them to look at it again. I'd be surprised if you come to any other conclusion. It was a speech on behalf of the haves. It showed contempt for the people we've talked about often today here, who have been suffering the effects of Brexit. We are told, we are told by Mr. Chapman, we simply have to cheer up. That's the deal we're to have. Well, on this occasion, there will be no deal. You can't cheer people up if, in fact, they are suffering the labour shortages that hospitality and other sectors are... No, I, no, thank you, Mr. Mandel. You can't cheer up in those circumstances. You can't cheer up if you're an EU national, like Marie's husband, who's being told that they don't have the right to stay here. Absolutely. You cannot cheer up if people are losing jobs as a result of Brexit. You are, those are not reasons to be cheerful. Those are not reasons to be cheerful. So if Mr. Chapman wants to come and tell us to cheer up, let him come to this chamber and let him actually let us tell us the truth about what will happen, even in the sector that he is purporting to represent, because there are fishing communities in my constituency who are looking at the issue of lorries full of fish and shellfish that will rot in the docks. They're looking at the decline of the market and they're realizing they have been sold, sold a dogfish, perhaps one would say, because they have not been told the truth about Brexit and certainly not by politicians like Michael Gove, who was, taught, who was mentioned uh, warmly by Mr. Chapman. I have to say, if Mr. Gove were to tell me that the sky was blue, I'd go outside to check. <laughs> no, <laughs> presiding officer. Fortunately, not all the debate was like that. The debate was a constructive debate. We have a great deal of work to do together to take this issue forward. I'm glad that we have agreements on the key issues like No Deal, the issues of the inadequacies of the withdrawal bill, and I'm grateful for the sensible part of the Tory front bench who has brought that forward this afternoon. I think we have the potential for making progress here. I just hope that people like Mr Chapman will listen to the wiser voices on their benches and not get carried away again as, as I said, the Doric Donald Trump. Thank you. That concludes our debate on Scotland and the EU-UK negotiations on EU exit. We move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of two business motions, motion 8399, setting out a business programme, 
and motion 8400 on a stage one timetable. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion, either motion, to press their request to speak button now. I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move both motions on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau. Move together. Thank you very much. And no member has asked to speak against either motion. The question is that motions 8399 and 8400 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of a Parliamentary Bureau motion. I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move motion 8097 on approval of an SSI. Formally moved. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I call on John Finney. <coughs> uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, President Officer, um, we've been here before on this particular issue. We've been here with an organisation called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Most recently, an organisation called the European Organisation for Astronomical Research in the Southern Hemisphere. And this year relates to a body called the Unified Patent Court. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, we're told, or we will be told by the Minister, this is about the Vienna Convention. I'd be more interested in a parliamentary convention, <coughs> excuse me, that government ministers don't request anybody, anyone, or any premises are not subject to Scots law. Now, we know from the information provided at the Justice Committee, and I quote, they shall also be exempt from devolved and local taxes in respect of salaries, wages, and emoluments. And the minister did say that we don't know how many officials in Scotland such exemptions could apply to. But we subsequently learn, and I'm grateful to the Minister for it, that the current forecast is it would be six part-time judges who may operate on occasions in Scotland. But what I'm interested in is the cumulative effect of all these various um, statutory instruments that have been brought here. Because in relation to the financial effects, we're told there's no financial effects on the Scottish Government or local government. Now, clearly, that simply is incorrect. And perhaps at some point we'll learn what that cumulative effect is, the number of people involved. What we did learn, and maybe a pointer to the future, <coughs> excuse me, is that temporary premises in respect of this organisation would not be inviolate. Police could enter these premises without a warrant. And that's a welcome reduction in respect of this particular um, organisation. One privilege less, and hopefully a model for the inevitable future orders that will be brought to the Parliament. <clears throat> Excuse me. Finally, I'd like to thank the Minister on a lighter note for clarification on another point, namely that the European Patent Office will not accept a patent that's filed in Gaelic. Um, and I sense another campaign coming on there. But I would ask members to reflect on the message that supporting this proposal sends to our constituents and to vote against it at decision time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I call on Annabel Ewing to respond. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Draft International Organisations, Immunities and Privileges, uh, Scotland Amendment No. 2, Order 2017, confers various legal immunities and privileges upon the Unified Patent Court, or UPC. The UPC is an international judicial body supported by 25 EU member states, including the United Kingdom. On 19 February 2013, the UK government signed the Intergovernmental Agreement to provide for a unified patent court within participating European Union countries. The protocol on privileges and immunities was done in Brussels on 29 June 2016. The order before the Parliament today fulfills Scotland's part of the obligations that entail from these international agreements. Equivalent provision in respect of reserve matters and in respect of devolved matters in the rest of the UK is being conferred by legislation at Westminster. When respect of parliamentary passage is complete, both orders will go before the Privy Council. Whilst this order is limited to the issue of privileges and immunities, I would like to say a little about the background to the UPC itself. The UPC will be a court common to the contracting member states and thus part of their judicial system. It will have exclusive competence in respect of European patents and European patents with unitary effect. Unitary effect means that a patent does not need to be validated in each country where the holder wants patent protection. Instead, the patent will provide uniform protection in up to 25 EU countries. The Preparatory Committee of the UPC has stated its aim of bringing the agreement into force in the spring of 2018. To meet this deadline, the UK and uh, Germany must deposit their instruments of ratification late 2017. The decision to sign up to the international obligations providing for UPC falls within the reserved responsibilities of the UK government and the parliament at Westminster. 
The specific purpose of this order is therefore to provide immunities and privileges on the UPC and its officials in the course of official activities in Scotland in order to reflect the equivalent Westminster order and the terms of the protocol on privileges and immunities. The order provides that judges, the registrar and the deputy registrar shall have immunity from suit and legal process in the course of performance of official duties. This immunity can be waived by the presidium of the court. Immunities and privileges are therefore limited in that they apply only to official actions and they can be waived. They do not give an individual carte blanche to commit criminal activity. An assault, for example, can still be prosecuted in the normal way. The immunity is therefore analogous to, but more <laughs> limited than that which has been for generations conferred upon diplomats working in foreign jurisdictions. As with diplomatic immunity, all individuals benefiting from privileges and immunities in Scotland are expected to respect Scots law. Presiding officer, the order will help the UK fulfil its international obligations in respect of Scotland and is therefore the duty of the Scottish Government to bring it forward to the Parliament. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. And there are three questions today. The first question is that Amendment 8352.1 in the name of Adam Tompkins, which seeks to amend Motion 8352 in the name of Michael Russell on Scotland and EU-UK negotiations on EU exit, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to division and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 8352.1 in the name of Adam Tompkins is yes, 30, no, 86. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. The next question is that motion 8352 in the name of Michael Russell on Scotland and EU-UK negotiations on EU exit be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote again and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 8352 in the name of Michael Russell is yes, 86, no, 30. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 8097 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of an SSI be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We we'll move to a vote and members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 8097 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick is yes, 107, no, 6. There were no abstentions. The motion is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Tom Arthur on Scotland's music industries, but we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.